Okay, we are live now. So this is uh, Indie Talk with, well, just me today because Jesse had some uh, tech issues again, but it is uh, Indie Talk with Jaron featuring AWF announcer DJ Draper. So how's it been going, DJ? Been going well. Uh, lots of AWF shows happening and uh, doing some stuff with First Now over the past year. So it's... Uh, been 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 enough on my plate to keep me busy in indie wrestling around here lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I've I've been uh, keeping up with the uh, our news about your shows and uh, just seeing uh, what's going on. And recently, or a few months ago, I heard that uh, uh, Bill Williams became the AWF champion. So that was uh, pretty awesome to hear. Bill knocked off Kyle Pro there, yeah. After about a year plus, Kyle uh, got the title during the pandemic back when we were uh, doing these TV tapings in an empty arena with no fans. And uh, Kyle and Stonehenge formed the program and were able to take over the company and kind of craft things how uh, they want it and their vision. And finally, Bill Williams was able to knock, knock Kyle off the mountain there and grab the title and he is going with it strong right now early on in his reign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems like it's been a pretty good reign, and I've been keeping up with uh, his social media to see how he's uh, – or his uh, title defenses and pictures and everything. So, yeah. All right. Funny uh, note about Bill Williams, I'll just sort of peel back the curtain a little bit. I've known that guy since I was nine. Uh, oh. Our parents actually cut meat together – uh, at Cub Foods down there in the South Metro, the Twin Cities. Oh. Uh, and his mom actually uh, coordinated uh, religion classes at the uh, local Catholic church in Prior Lake, Minnesota. And so every <laughs> Wednesday night, I would head in there and, and see his mom. And uh, I remember going over to his house once, I think, for trick-or-treating or something like that. So Bill and I go way back. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't. Well, I didn't. Yeah, it was awesome to hear a story like that because I I didn't know that that's how you guys met. This even before wrestling and AWF. So. Long, long time before that. <laughs> yeah, is uh, he older or younger than you? He's younger than me by a couple years. So. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, like you said, you are the AWF announcer. So. Uh, Talk about your role as being the announcer for AWF and everything you do with it. All right. Yeah, I've been, um, I guess, full-time consistently with uh, the AWF since October of 2010 uh, when I got the call there to, uh, at that time, I was doing the ring announcing and uh, doing the uh, color commentary with Mick Karsh. I was doing uh, more of a heel thing back then, which was interesting as the uh, ring announcer when you're putting over sponsors and trying to get the crowd all riled up and then all of a sudden it's uh nope I gotta be a real jerk on the headset so that was uh an interesting go of things but yeah it's been a uh, going on 12 years now I think uh, and this is now long since uh since Arya Davari first got the call to go to WWE uh, with the exception of Eric Cannon and Ryan Cruz whenever he uh pops up around the AWF. I think I'm the longest uh, longest serving personnel there other than Tony DiNucci and his wife by a long time. So oh, um, yeah. been yeah. with uh, uh, this group since 2010 when back then we were on 45. We were on their uh, Saturday nights, half hour doing uh, TV tapings, very similar to how we do them now. And then there was a period where we shifted over to uh, CW Channel 23 for a couple years, and then I think uh, we've been back on 45 now in the Saturday noon time slot for, I want to say, six years. So uh, to be on TV this long in a market, uh, regardless of whether it's cable access, whether it's uh, bartered programming like this is, whether you actually get a you know deal to be paid to be on TV, which I don't think uh, with the landscape of media right now, that really happens. Uh, I've been a pretty good run with some good wrestlers coming along the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's had a pretty good run, and Tony's been 
doing a great job of uh, running it and people are still going to the shows. And I believe you guys are doing the, the shows at the different high schools. So definitely getting the younger guys and younger uh, uh, audience into it. So that's how uh, AWF's a bit different from some of the other, uh, other independent groups. We don't run uh, one building a month, which there's advantages and disadvantages to that where we travel all over the, Five state area to any high school, any town festival, uh, restaurants, event centers, armories, um, on and on, um, opening for for bands. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think uh, AWF's been unique in the diversity of the uh, events and the partners that we've had over the years, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that you guys. Uh... I've had a lot of partners and you guys do a lot of charity events for the, the sales of the events. So yeah, it's really cool that you guys are doing all that. Totally. It's uh, every time that we go to a new town, it's you got to kind of have a mindset that you're not necessarily going to have quote unquote wrestling fans there. You're going to have mm-hmm. um, certainly people who watch current product, who, uh, grew up with the AWA, maybe watched it during the Attitude Area era, and a lot of the time those people are bringing their kids now, and it's those kids mm-hmm. that that go nuts for a back body drop or a drop kick, or in some cases an arm drag. And when you have mm-hmm. crowds that aren't trained wrestling fans, so to speak, it's easier to get some of those reactions and big reactions for stuff that. If it happened on a national broadcast, people would go, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, sometimes it does have advantages and disadvantages, but I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think having, going to all the different schools, it definitely is, uh, I mean, it's working for you guys, so. Yeah. And when we're going to rural areas, a lot of times there's not much in the way of entertainment. They have to either drive to Fargo or to Rochester or to Duluth or uh, to the Twin Cities, which in some cases can be a two, three hour drive if they want to see a big time sporting event or if they want to see live music or if they want to see pro wrestling. And to be honest, I don't know if WWE even go to Fargo or Duluth or Mankato anymore. So this might be the only wrestling they see live uh, in their entire lives, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So we try to go out and put a good show on for them. Yeah. 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 I think it was, I think it was in January or something. uh, WWE had like a house show. And I think, uh, I think they said that was like their first show in Fargo in like 10 years or something. So yeah, it doesn't go to that area a whole lot. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, speaking of that Fargo show, I really wish I could have gone to that, but I had uh, transportation issues at the last second and uh, it could have been my first AWF show, but definitely in the future, I hope to go to one. That's something I think I for uh, forgot to mention in my laundry list of places the American Wrestling Federation runs events is churches. Mm-hmm. And Tony oh, Danucci is yeah. a man of faith and he is able to um weave in his testimony to um have outreach with youth groups occasionally i believe the um uh, atonement lutheran church where we were up in in fargo uh, was raising some money for mission trips and to bring pro wrestling into uh, a house of worship like that's definitely unique and it's something that danucci's been able to uh, do on more than one occasion and every time I, I think there are people there have to be people at these churches either uh, just m- members or uh, in the clergy or in the administration that are skeptical uh, about whether or not something like this will work but then when they see that we put forward a family-friendly product and uh, see the reaction uh, that especially the younger folks have to what we're doing out there they they, I don't think regret it one bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to hear and uh, be at a wrestling event when it's in like a, a sanctuary or a church of some kind and then 
I always make the joke of like, oh, wrestling just got holy or something. So. <laughs> and, and then Eric Cannon with uh, First has had uh, several shows down at Temple of Aaron in Highland Park in St. Paul. And we were able to, um, it was the first time was their annual summer festival. And I think uh, Rabbi Jeremy Fine, who uh, mm. kicked that all off, talked about how well, Eh, some of the elders of the synagogue might have a bit of an issue with this, but I think we owe it to owe it to the community to at least try, and that's I think paid off dividends for both the synagogue and and for first wrestling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to one first wrestling show, and there was at the the Temple of Aaron, and that that's just okay. an amazing venue to be in, and it was probably the. I would say probably the biggest venue I've been in. So biggest indoor venue. So yeah. Cool little yeah. space they got there. Uh, what was that? Ah, cool space they got there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was back in December. I got to see uh, Aria Davari and Tony Nice versus Dante Martin and uh, Alex Zane. So definitely a big main event. Mm-hmm. Great to see guys like Davari develop. Through the years, that's been something that's been so neat about this from way back when I started uh, started out uh, to see guys like CM Punk and then Ace Steel and uh, Cold Cabana and Austin Aries and Ken Anderson move their way up. And then you see another generation now getting their shot on national TV like we're seeing uh, with Top Flight, really rewarding to see. So uh, to mm-hmm. see guys that that you saw when they were wrestling in front of nobody now wrestling in front of worldwide audiences. is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 I thought I, well, I technically didn't get to see uh, Dante Martin in like the early AWF days, but then to hear that he was just wrestling a few years ago and his, I've seen his brother uh, uh, Darius Martin wrestle and to see them get the attention that they are in uh, AEW is really awesome to hear and see. I think uh, Dante Martin actually won the AWF Heavyweight Championship. Again, going back to the laundry list of venues that we've had shows in, uh, mm-hmm. I believe it was a meat locker. We uh, down in Pine Island, Minnesota, had a, a meat locker. Had a had they have an annual block party or something, and they brought us in and um, set us up there in the parking lot. They had the locker room actually back um, in, in the area where they do have the sides of beef hanging. So you had guys have the opportunity to kind of do the Rocky thing to oh. warm up. But yes, uh, Dante Martin became American Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion on that day back in, I think, uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's definitely here. The like, interesting to hear, uh, uh, early Dante Martin stories. And if, uh, any, uh, uh, maybe or may or may not be, uh, current AEW fans that only watch AEW if they, are hearing stories of uh, Dante Martin back in the day. It's, uh, I think, definitely awesome to hear where, where he came and where he's uh, going. So, yeah. Angel Dorado uh, was his name back then, wore the, uh, wore the mask, and at some point decided that he'd let us all see what he looks like, and now mm-hmm. he's uh, in front of global stages. So good for him and good for his brother, too, who yeah. also used to formerly wear that mask as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they it, uh, they both wore the mask, and I uh, Darius was uh, Airwolf before too. So, yeah. Um, look, yeah, just looking at the comments here. Uh, All Out Pro Wrestling uh, owner Pete King just says good evening. So, I just wanted to uh, shout out to Pete right there. So, yeah. Um, let's go with another question. Uh, so, I, yeah, I was looking through and I saw that in 2013 you were part of the, the CW Twin Cities booth uh, talking about the AWF. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? That was a fun day. Uh, they had us in there for about an hour. Uh, the thing that kind of was tough about it because we had it was me, Johnny Parks at the time, who was also uh, sometimes wrestler, sometimes color commentator with me, and Tony Danucci. And Parks was the only one who made it to the actual station where they used to be uh, just on Como Boulevard there across from the fairgrounds. And they were going to just bring us in 
uh, as they were obviously a vendor. And I was stuck on this park and ride that would not go. It was just oh. stuck in traffic. And I'm mm. like, ah, mm. I did. I not driving to the fairgrounds because finding parking is always a nightmare. And these park and rides are normally reliable. <laughs> I mean, let's uh, get in there. And then this park and ride was taking forever. So I get to the station and there's parks that not urgent at all because who else isn't there? Tony Danucci stuck in traffic on his way from oh. Elk River. So we finally, just the two of us get escorted into the fairgrounds and uh, they had a little stage set up there and we popped up some video and some uh, photos of some of the guys and talked about them. And to be honest, our audience that day, I'm going to guess they were more interested in the shade and in the benches and the picnic tables that were in front of us. A good yeah. opportunity for fairgoers to uh, relax, maybe to enjoy their Prano Puff or um, any or their cheese curds or uh, beer garita, perhaps, if they were imbibing in that at one in the afternoon and get, kind of got to talk about our product, uh, expand our audience a little bit. It was neat to partner with the station. Uh, they had some advertisements up around their booth. Uh, so yeah, that was a interesting experience just to jibber jabber about wrestling in front of a crowd that may or may not be familiar with you for the better part of an hour. So that was, that was definitely fun. Cool. Yeah, and, and one day, one day, the fair is going to allow pro wrestling. <laughs> I, I, mm. I guess there's some pushback uh, over the years. People have brought it up, and their mm. management concerned about the violence a little bit. So mm. maybe that's one of those things that time just needs to do its work, and at some point we can. If we can have wrestling in churches, if we can have wrestling in synagogues, if we can have wrestling in meat, at meat lockers uh, and high school gyms, I think uh, we can probably find a place to do it at the state fair sometime. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it would be uh, pretty cool to have wrestling at the state fair because, I mean, everyone's already there. And uh, probably if it's just out there, they're definitely going to be interested. Like, what is, what is this wrestling thing doing here? And then they check it out and hopefully get interested into it. So yeah, I figure there'll be more people interested in that than log rolling or some of the other <laughs> acts that they have. So yeah. Yeah. I would think that wrestling would be a lot cooler than all that. So I mean, two guys or tag team or two guys uh, going at it in the ring. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I was looking at the comments on Instagram. Uh, Another, another Jesse, uh, he, he was talking about uh, the Sanctuary Event Center in Fargo, North Dakota a little bit just because we were on the topic of uh, wrestling in churches. And I've been to the Sanctuary in Fargo, and it's definitely uh, – it's always, yeah, always interesting to be in a sanctuary or a church for wrestling. So but The space just lends itself to, to wrestling with a high ceiling, number one. That's the biggest barrier – when you're trying to find a venue to have wrestling is somewhere where you can bring in a big ring where you don't have to find Terry Fox's little baby ring. That's one foot off the ground. You can actually have the uh, 16 or 18 footer and guys can do full back body drops and superplexes and four fifties and all that. So churches generally uh, or other houses of worship have that accommodation and, the big space where you can set up set up chairs and then usually a stage, which is also helpful either for uh, either for an entrance way or uh, even sometimes a locker room is sometimes a behind a curtain at an auditorium's a uh, better locker room than some venues have. We'll just put it that way. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I was looking through the comments again. Uh, Pete King's talking about your next uh, AWF show, and you you guys are using a uh, uh, his current APW Women's Champion, uh, Leslie La Munyeka. Do you have any uh, relationship with her, or how did you guys uh, get in contact with her? I haven't seen her compete. Uh, she's going to be going up against Raven Raddix, who has previously appeared for the AWF uh, as a manager for Gunner Wicks. Uh, big beast of a man from the Milwaukee area. Uh, yeah. But it's, I got to say, been far too long since we've had uh, women's wrestling in the AWF period when I had uh, 
during the pandemic, I had the Draper Dialogues on our Facebook page and I interviewed Tony Danucci and I had to put it straight up to him, like saying, hey, what's the deal? When are we going to finally have women's wrestling matches in the AWF? Noting that we've had women main event WrestleManias. There's a women's Royal Rumble now. Like uh, time, can, like, why are we so far behind the times? And really what it boiled down to for him was he started running high school shows in the mid 2000s, 2007 or so. And there was still, uh, you'd run into athletic directors and principals and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Their memory of wrestling was, frankly, the smut from the Attitude Era, where yeah. Vince McMahon's on TV making these poor women go out and do God knows what uh, that's dehumanizing. And that that branding right there made it so tough for uh, to even broach the topic of having mm -hmm. women on a card, which is just completely absurd when you look back at it and uh, mm -hmm. see all the talent that's out there, not just on the indie level, uh, but that's shining on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights right now. Uh, so I'm, I'm, we two years ago had a match with ODB uh, came in. She uh, wrestled Elena Black from the Chicago area. But other than that, I don't think uh, we, we've had a women's match in AWF. And I know that me and others have advocated for that. It's certainly time. And uh, with Leslie and Raven coming up here on Saturday um, at our event coming up, I hope that's the first uh, the first of many women's matches that we can have in the AWF. And, the, and to be honest, a lot of the crowds, when we talk about younger AWF crowds, a lot of them are girls. And they deserve to see mm. uh, people out there competing that they can look up to and aspire to be one day, too. too. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously, it, uh, I mean, as much numbers and uh, money as it did draw out events, I, it was just really, not, yeah, not the best time for wrestling in the early 2000s for WWE female talents. And now that it has progressed and they're actually uh, wrestling, I think that's important. And uh, there's, yeah, so many wrestler female talents in the Midwest that are uh, looking to be on a show, and uh, I believe that any show should uh, have incorporate at at least I would say two to three, but I know usually I've really I've only seen maybe one to two. So, well, like, numbers are what they are, and there are obviously fewer um, women talent than men talent out there, and that's just mm -hmm. the reality of it. But I, I think when you have, um, it, I, I won't say it's parity, but right now on the national level, it's fairly close to equal numbers if maybe that's a bit of an over exaggeration but progress has definitely been made over the years for, and that's a good thing uh, yeah 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 definitely yeah uh what was uh, last weekend i was in uh, hudson wisconsin for Ironheart pro wrestling and saw my first ever fatal four-way of uh, women's uh, match so it's definitely cool to see uh, where the women wrestling is going in the Midwest and in certain companies. So, yeah. We've, uh, since I've gotten to start working for first over the last year, uh, we've brought in a plethora of talent. Uh, Sky Blue now signed to AEW. Uh, Billy yeah. Stark's really fun to watch in there. Uh, Badger Briggs, who for uh, unfortunate that she had that uh, – injury that set back with that ACL was just what she was able to do in just such a short amount of time was amazing. Uh, free range Kara certainly come a long way too. So we have tons of talent out here and they deserve a spotlight. Yeah. 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 I've, uh, I've seen Badger Briggs wrestle one time for time bomb pro wrestling and, uh, in November and she, yeah, she's definitely a amazing female talent and probably one of the toughest out there right now. So. Yeah. Um, looking through the comments, uh, Tom Burdick says DJ is a number one announcer. So ah, Tom Burdick from up, up on up on the Iron Range, uh, up uh, the the, the Keywatton, or or uh, I think he might be in Hibbing up there. Uh, <laughs> uh, wrestling gone wild. Uh, a couple times I had the opportunity to go up there and do some ring announcing for him and and those shows on the range. So. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go with another question. Uh, 
Um, when did you uh, officially get involved in the, the Midwest wrestling uh, territories? So it uh, started as a fan. Uh, go, uh, I got the internet. I want to say I was uh, 99. So I would have been 15 or so then. Mm. Uh, started searching around message boards and saw there was this super popular group uh, that was taken the scene by storm called St. Paul Championship Wrestling running down at the West St. Paul Armory and uh, mm. saw some really uh, good things about that with, I believe at the time, Adam Pierce was the champion and you had other folks like CM Punk and Colt Cabana and Danny Dominion and Ricky Noga and plus some other mainstays of the indie scene, which I had uh, gone to a couple of. Uh, there was one locally in Prior Lake actually in two consecutive years uh, with guys like Scotty Zappa and the Hellraisers, one of which went on to be Magnus Maximus and Bam Neely in the WWE for a little bit. Uh, Horse the Psychopath, uh, another one. Um, and so a couple buddies and I decided to go down to the armory to check this out. Uh, hmm. And we actually got there when it was the first uh, TV taping for at the time, uh, Steel Domain Wrestling, they had just rebranded to be a, uh, have a bigger net, I guess, with their branding, so to speak. St. Paul was just regional. Uh, so I think the station, if I recall, one had suggested it, at mm -hmm. least. And they were, uh, they did their first TV taping that night, and we got to see some pretty cool talent and uh, kept coming back every, every month. They were running shows there at West St. Paul all the way through. Um, and that was 2001 at that time. Uh, and then at December, I think of that year, there was the, uh, see, so back then there was, there wasn't Facebook, there wasn't Twitter, there wasn't Instagram. It was just, you had message boards and that's where people aired their drama instead. <laughs> and uh, there was, there was some drama there, uh, with, uh, mm -hmm. CM Punk and, uh, Danny Dominion and a steel, uh, with, with steel domain. And then, so. Uh, from there, you had more of the local talents being featured. Uh, your Scotty Zappas, your JB Trusts, Johnny Parks, Horse Psychopath, etc. And I just still kept coming to these shows. Uh, another fellow and I had started a fan page at that time uh, with our own message board. We'd put up our own reviews uh, hmm. of what we saw at the shows. And from there, we uh, started, it would actually be kind of a precursor to podcasting. This is now going back to 2002, hmm. uh, where we were, uh, I was I'm trying to think of the name of the web, fancast.com, where uh, similar to this, except audio, and the audio would buffer, even if you were on a cable modem. So hmm. we would get on, we did the, I'd say, couple months every Wednesday night or something like that, just like now, and just shoot the shit about what was going on with, with uh, SDW and occasionally other wrestling around town. And then I got the bright idea once I got a, a laptop computer through Winona State University where I went to their laptop university. Every student got one. I figured, well, I have this laptop. It has a microphone input. Why don't we bring this to shows and interview some of the guys? So we started doing that and podcasting wouldn't be a thing for a couple more years. So we used the uh, super high tech technology of real audio. I don't know if you even might not even be old enough to, to know what that is. Uh, not real. I mean, I was born in 2002, but. <laughs> okay. Really. So we're talking, you're just. I was Maybe just not even in diapers first. at that point yet. <laughs> yeah. You might have been anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. Where bandwidth was so limited, you couldn't physically download the whole file. You had to stream mm -hmm. it from a real audio. But anyway, we were getting guys wanting to come on there. And at the time, it was fun interviewing guys like Tony Danucci was one of mm -hmm. our first guests. And we had Ken Anderson on a couple times before he went big and Sean Vivari. Uh, was another one, Derek St. Holmes, who I think still might be around in Wisconsin. Johnny Parks uh, hmm. never hesitated to hop on and uh, chat about wrestling with us. So that was fun. And then something you realize when you're uh, doing this sort of thing is that whenever you have 
and you, you might be starting to learn this too. Uh, whenever you have an outfit for this or like this, or uh, the boys get interested when you start talking about them. I remember doing some uh, reviews of shows where we weren't too harsh or anything, but there were times I would be objectively critical and mm. notice getting the cold shoulder in an after party. Uh, guys not necessarily being appreciative of what you said, but then you, I asked someone else about it, like, I'm really shocked that they even noticed that I put this out on the internet. And then an uh, the individual told me that, like, the boys go nuts for this stuff. They love the validation. They love <laughs> the feedback. They uh, love no noticing that uh, people are noticing what they're doing. So I uh, kept doing that and then eventually got uh, Ed Hellier brought me in to do some of his press releases and uh, posters, website, ring crew. That was uh, really one of the biggest ways for anyone to get more involved. Uh, and then uh, doing his music. And I was actually, uh, when I was asked to do it, at the time they had a CD boombox. You go around the locker room, collect CDs from all the guys and write down what track number it is. First guy comes out, hit play, turn up the dial, fade it out, mm. and eject really quickly, expeditiously as you can, expeditiously, I think should be the word there. I uh, mm. apologize for being inarticulate. <laughs> anyway, and then you drop the other CD in, find the right track, hit play, turn it back up, fade it down, wash, rinse, repeat, and I realized I have this laptop I can play music from. So I started <laughs> yeah. cutting uh, MP3s there and might have actually been one of the first people at the time to use a laptop computer to play music at a wrestling show. I think that had to have been, uh, two, that was 2002. Uh, mm. So, and then, yeah, that's how I got uh, brought in at least as a helper slash hanger on slash a, uh, Jack of all trades doing some of the ancillary work that uh, goes into pro wrestling before I got the opportunity to ring announce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's definitely cool that uh, you got involved at, at that age. And I would say, I would say I got, well, yes, yeah, I at least started going to Midwest shows when I was 17 in 2000, like seven. I think it was 2017, 17 years old. So, yeah, I was doing that. And, uh, yeah, I kept going to shows. And uh, I think my first show was uh, under the big top one, the the Mitch Paradise. Ah, Mitch, okay. Yeah. And that was, yeah, definitely an awesome show for, for my first show. And just I thought it was awesome and kept going. And now years later doing this. So, yeah. I mean, back then I wouldn't even have imagined uh, a video streaming platform <laughs> yeah 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 you were pretty cool what you get the opportunity to do with mm -hmm. technology these days mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's insane how all tech or technology evolves and especially how it evolves with the the wrestling business so yeah and you did your thing when you were 15 and now you're pretty much a mainstay in uh, awf so yeah yeah i'm trying to think like uh Granted, it's I've kind of had the, you know, AWF branding on the, uh, on my forehead there. In fact, do I still have this? Yes. Uh, I, I also serve as the commissioner of the uh, FLWA, the French Lake Wrestling Association, and oh. I occasionally have to bring the hammer down there. But I, I have been called in to ring announce there as well, and in, in my uh, I still have it from our last event. Uh, this past December in Silver Lake, uh, my my compensation envelope from their their board of directors, of course, says says this. If that doesn't tell you what uh, mm. the uh, how this the stench of AWF can just I'm just kidding. It's not a stench. It's a something I adore very much and enjoy uh, doing these shows. But when you're with someone a group that long, you definitely become more associated. Uh, with them, but I think uh, of the groups that have been around as long as I've been doing this, I want to say I've ring announced or done play-by-play -play or something for every single one of them. So, mm. 
Hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think I've heard uh, briefly of the FLWA and I believe last year I did see a poster for, there was a June or show for June. And I, I kind of wish I would have gotten to that, but I just uh, typically hear it, hear it now and then. And I believe uh, uh, the first show we did, uh, Jay Soltis was talking about it. So uh, Jay, Jay Soltis generally uh, uh, does does ring announcing there uh, instead of instead of refereeing. I think it's easier for him to go uh, go to the bar and, and back to to where uh, the sound is all set up than than when you're refereeing. So he takes advantage of that definitely. Uh, in the FLWA, we give him some leeway. Jay's a Jay's a great guy. Jay was uh, refereeing those first shows that. I was going to at the West St. Paul Armory uh, for Steel Domain back in the early 2000s and uh, been around for forever and uh, such a good mind for what what works mm -hmm. in the ring and uh, definitely a good guy to grab a beer with and to see a ball game with too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, one of those times I got a, I don't, I'm not sure if they have had been, been doing too many shows but uh it definitely would be cool to see jay soltis as a wrestling announcer compared to uh i mean i've seen him as a ref but i think it would be a cool contrast to see him like that flwa definitely runs uh more sporadic shows um that used to be uh, i remember a stretch of four or five years where we had a series of uh community festivals out west of the metro there was um, the Good Neighbor Days in Howard Lake and um, South Haven Days where these small towns are just shut down for the weekend. They have the street dance and they have vendors and they have the turtle race and they have all this stuff. But then we set up the wrestling ring just on the uh, intersection of Main Street and everyone comes out to watch and it's just so much fun to see um and this is where you get a mixture of not just kids yelling, but you have grown-ups who may or may not have been imbibing in beverages uh, since sunup, and they're getting into things too. And uh, hmm. those were some really fun days with uh, uh, with the high rollers. Uh, you saw them be were considered the proprietors of the FLWA. They're Sterling uh, High Roller STX, and then we recently lost uh, Jerry uh, High Roller Mago, but uh, those were those were some fun times for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, definitely. Uh, sounds like it was a good time for uh, the wrestling. So yeah, uh, yeah. Looking in the comments again, uh, P King says he wants to see uh, Mitch Paradise against Tony Danucci again. God, I wonder how many years of that uh, <laughs> that has to have been since. That happened. I I know Mitch doesn't wrestle as frequently as he used to, and uh, neither does Tony. Uh, his uh, frequency of wrestling's gone down to. Uh, um, I yeah. think his. Uh, I think he has very close immediate family members that would be upset with him if he were to uh, mm. try to wrestle again. But uh, at our most recent AWF event, you had the front man Jossie challenge him. Uh, up in Pine City, and we're going to be coming back to to that city this summer, uh, this June or July, I believe. And and the people might be uh, wanting to see Tony get his hands on Jossie. So we'll oh. see if if Tony can step up to the plate one more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be a pretty good match to see. I've, I mean, I mean, Tony. Danucci. I mean, not from a technical standpoint, because Tony Danucci, uh, let's yeah. let's put it this way, he's not exactly the great Muda in there. Though at one time he. Did have a good handspring elbow. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've gone back and seen some of his matches, and I mean, back in the day, he was pretty good against uh, Davari and then and, and Steel the Main and everything. So, yeah. And then Jossie, definitely a great talent. I've I've seen him a number of times now, and he's I think he's great on the mic. But probably, uh, or his mic skills are insane and it's just awesome to see that so. i think he oozes charisma and has a boundless potential to be a star in this business and i would be shocked if we weren't seeing him on cable and broadcast television within a couple of years 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would definitely be, be uh, pretty awesome to see. Um, okay, yeah, so in, uh, in 2019, the AWF uh, had a show with uh, Eugene. Did, do you have any conversations with him? We've uh, had Eugene on uh, several AWF shows. Oh. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, one at the Richfield American Legion we had. Uh, actually, it was the last AWF event we had before everything got all shut down due to the uh, pandemic. It was in Iowa. I'm trying to remember the name of the town. It was just uh, nearby Okaboji, but we had him um, there for that at, gosh, this is going to really upset me that I can't remember the name of the town, but uh, we've, de- yeah, we've definitely had, had Nick uh, join us on several occasions, and he has a great deal of experience and knowledge to share with the guys and people still remember who he is from his stint on, on WWE TV. And uh, with as much talent as he has, it's uh, uh, too bad. That was kind of his ceiling in, in WWE, just being saddled with that gimmick. And um, it seems to have been a successful trainer, though I understand he's starting to wind that down. Uh, with with his school and his wrestling promotion out there in Sioux Falls. But, yeah, uh, Nick, uh, Eugene, always reliable to have around on, on any indie show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was it on, uh, in September when I originally came up to the Fargo-Moorhead area? I went to Below Zero Wrestling, and I got to see Eugene versus the system, so... That was uh, quite the match. Eugene had uh, wrestled the system once uh, at the Richfield American Legion. And this was one time I wasn't wasn't happy with Eugene. We had system in the ring. Mm-hmm. Eugene's music played and played and played and played and played. And I'm like, is this guy going to get out here? Is the referee going to need to count him out? Mm-hmm. They restarted his music. I think it played one full track length again. And then he finally came out and got on the mic and started ripping into the system, which oh. uh, ripping on that guy at that time, especially uh, when he was general manager of AWF, was mm-hmm. was welcome to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I do. I've gone back and I did uh, hear that system was uh, an AWF uh uh or was it commissioner or owner? he was general manager. Yeah, um, that's the word. Yeah. General manager and uh, yeah, that's definitely. Uh, and he also lost uh, to Tony Danucci in what I believe was his last match as a wrestler. Oh, okay. Oh, huh. yeah. Awesome history facts we got here. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember seeing uh, old AWF stuff of uh, System and the PD Brown War. Do you have uh, comments on that? They, they definitely had some wars there with uh, Petey was general manager as well. And uh, it was uh, the system had the faction of zero sympathy. It was almost like he was a cult leader trying to pour the packet of Kool-Aid mix in as many glasses as he possibly could to grow that mm-hmm. faction that had Sterling Bond and, and Crixus, who still is an active competitor on the AWF roster. Uh, they mm-hmm. were working as his henchmen to try to maintain control over the company. It came to a point where Tony Danucci just, just couldn't take it anymore. And I mm-hmm. uh, had to, had to take all system out to the woodshed to, to show him who's boss. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Those wars were pretty insane. And I believe, uh, uh, one of the batches, it was, a. Uh, Bring a weapon, bring a weapons match, and uh, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that that is the one. Uh, yeah, that was an interesting ma- match to see. I watched it all on uh, YouTube and saw that match, and that's how that's how I came up with the made the, the custom Petey Brown Pac Man wrestling figure. So, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And then he did uh, later featured on his YouTube channel, and then showcased uh, that match too so yeah yeah um pd's been one of those guys who's definitely been creative using video editing and whatnot i think this is one thing that the 
pandemic kind of taught us is, and especially with us in the AWF to uh, push us in a, a newer direction with some of our digital stuff. And now we can, uh, since we couldn't film anything in person, we were able to use uh, webcams to effectively create content or use, I mean, these phones have better cameras than what uh, the video camera on mini DV tape could film 15, 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. certainly ways to do things and like uh, what we were doing with uh, our, our Draper Dialogues podcast and what we do now with AWF Insider. These are fairly, uh, there's certainly work involved, but uh, mm -hmm. fairly simple things to pull together. Like you can stream yards, a, a, outfit that I know several people use for their podcasts and uh, and pd has been able to create content and keep himself relevant during a time when there really wasn't a lot of wrestling going on so uh, mm -hmm. that I think someone to look toward for wrestlers to be consistently using uh, all facets of the internet, uh, internet to get yourself over yeah 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 I think he's he's probably one of the few that uh, does promote himself with the the the, the video making uh, that he does on YouTube, and uh, I I watch some of his videos here and there, and he, he definitely has a a good time uh, making the videos. So yeah, I wish oh, he does. Him. Trust me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's definitely got a creative mind for that, and he adds in like the the funny movie scenes and memes and all that. So yeah, yeah. Uh. Okay. Um, uh, have you been involved in a wrestling spot slash uh, taken a bump? Uh, only taken uh, two bumps, and they're not really bumps per se. There was a time I was ring announcing for SDW. This had to have been 04, 05. Mm. And I can't remember the exact circumstances, but it involved a wrestler named gauge octane who um came out and uh who trying to remember there was who was all who all the parties were involved there was uh whoever the manager was at the time it might have been george shire the authority it might have been someone else was handcuffed to the ring and couldn't interfere and then gauge octane came over and socked me right in the face and I fell over like a sack of potatoes mm -hmm. and he was able to get the handcuff key for me. And mm -hmm. then and there was another time it was, uh, I cannot remember who JB Trask was wrestling, but they started uh, brawling over toward where I was seated uh, as a ring announcer and knocked me right over. And I took a bump off of this banquet chair onto a banquet floor. Oh. And um, mm -hmm. that I, I don't think counts as a bump either there was though uh I, this probably counts as a spot back when i was uh i'd mentioned i was a heel once upon a time in the awf and mm -hmm. i was managing the black stallion now known as chad Wentworth the third he was a long time reigning american wrestling federation heavyweight champion there mm -hmm. was a circumstance where if he was not victorious over i believe it was wildcat uh, where I would be forced to wear a dress. So I, I did have to, uh, Johnny Parks dragged me to the dressing room area and I did Don a uh, hmm. out inside the ring. And that's that. Now this is where we get to being a uh, bad guy. And then also the ring announcer. Immediately after that, I needed to uh, draw all the, and announce all the raffle winners from the various raffles and giveaways the sponsors had. So that was mm. a super fun experience to do that while wearing this moo, -moo that uh, didn't really fit all that well, if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Sounds like a, a Johnny Parks thing to do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's uh, always interesting to hear uh, jo uh, Johnny Parks' old stuff because I know – I know now uh, he runs as uh, King Leonidas, so I've only been able to see King, the King Leonidas character in action. So he's yeah. one of those guys that uh, I I was I don't even know if I had started doing the music yet, but I was uh, 
hanging around and I uh, sat down. They actually invited me to sit down uh, with them at their table at a skill domain after party at Buffalo Wild Wings and uh, yeah. which was like, wait a minute here. I'm just this kid with this website. Why, why the yeah. hell are you all giving me the time of day? And then they were smarting me up a little bit. Part of that's to give uh, their perspective on wrestling uh, mm -hmm. to me. And, and and frankly, looking back, some of that uh, listening to veterans is good. There's definitely insight to be had. Uh, but sometimes guys have narrow minds. And when you, uh, I, I don't know if I necessarily want to name names, but there were guys that were starting to be up and comers then who uh, some of the veterans didn't exactly like, and there may have been some jealousy. So you always, when you're listening to, uh, to wrestlers sometimes have a grain of salt when they're giving you an opinion on a certain guy, because there may be other motivations there. And uh, hopefully no one's going to come on your show and start uh, <laughs> shit talking other guys. But if that, Mm -hmm. happens just to uh, keep an open mind that there's so much about wrestling to enjoy so many different styles of wrestling so many different types of wrestlers so many different companies people just got to enjoy what they like and go from there uh, mm -hmm. and, and sink or swim based on your talents individually and your abilities and i think with uh some of those guys that we saw rise to the top uh with national Companies that some other veterans didn't really think all that much of can show you sometimes um, mm. how, how much those opinions are truly worth. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, it's, yeah, I guess, it, I, I mean, maybe it pushes them to, to be uh, better, but I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it is wrestling and we got, I think Midwest wrestling's never been as big as it has been, so. It's definitely cool to hear that it's uh, uh that yeah that these stars are getting that attention and uh, future stars are getting the attention too. So yeah. Uh, oh, I'm just looking at the the chat right now. Uh, Kenny Defiance says a uh, great show so far. So yeah, yeah. Kenny, he's uh, I know he's done a. Uh, I think maybe seen him one time but i know he does a lot of maw stuff so right. yeah yeah um uh what what excites you about uh midwest independent wrestling every day like what do you look forward to when i mean when you just think about wrestling in the territories uh, great crowds uh frankly are are intoxicating i this past fall got to uh work my first Russell Palooza and to be in that, uh, uh, crow's nest up there with a sound booth and see a jam packed crowd that are so energetic. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost intoxicating, even though you're not, you're, you're doing play by play up above. You're not in the ring. You're not part of it per se, but you're there and it's pretty friggin' cool. Likewise, when you get a high school gym where you got people raging from four to, to 80 that are all into what they're seeing and letting, letting the wrestlers know what they like, vocally letting them know what they don't like, mm -hmm. and you get that in different ways. And no matter the venue or their circumstance, whenever there is there's a big loud crowd that's i would say my favorite and frankly there's times when that's not there uh in indie wrestling there's been uh remember the one bar show in lacrosse wisconsin i can't even remember the promoter's name but it was one of those situations where the promoter thought that this it was a mexican restaurant he, he thought the mexican restaurant was going to do all the advertising the restaurant thought that the promoter was going to do all the advertising oh, no. about half half hour before bell time. And we got a couple of the boys going out to try to put put letters on the sandwich board that they have wrestling tonight. Oh. And I think we had 
one of the wrestlers significant others was the only one in the crowd and the promoter was still paying us so we went out there and did the <laughs> show but those yeah. situations suck mm. no other way to put it so it makes you really grateful when you can pull together a good crowd that's into it with good wrestling matches good energy good heat um mm. uh, i i think that's one thing that and and it's kind of inevitable with the way kayfabe has slipped away where you don't have the genuine hate that wrestling fans have toward dastardly heels when they do something bad. Um, mm. That's something that unfortunately is a, the, that toothpaste isn't going to be put back in the tube, but there are times when you can uh, carefully develop a persona uh, like Darren Corbin, for instance, has, Mm. Done, done this masterfully. Uh, Nick Nelson, when we go to some of these AWF towns, able to pull it off really, really well. It's not just cheap heat. It's where you get, uh, where these people want to see nothing more than to see your ass get kicked and you to get pinned mm. and the good guy to go on the ropes and do this and mm. yay. Uh, yeah. That's, more than even uh, technical wrestling, high flying wrestling, scientific wrestling, brawling, no matter what kind of match it is, when you uh, have a good crowd, good heat, people into it, that's that one. That's what makes me excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, yeah, I've, like you, I've been to shows where uh, crowds are not into it, and I mean, sometimes it's been like. A uh, little charity event wrestlings, and most of, most of them are there just because, like, oh, it's something to do, and they don't know the whole wrestling chance. But yeah, when you do have a, a full wrestling crowd and they're into it, and they're uh, yeah, just all into it, it's definitely uh, a better show. So yeah, yeah. Like the uh, first time I, I it was actually I might be a, might have cursed the promotion back then, but the first time I had ring announced for Steel Domain, it was. Uh, after a long stretch of running at the West St. Paul Armory with 200 plus people, I think there were like 120. And when you're used to louder, larger crowds to get up there and try to get people excited, that, that can be tough. And it's worse when you're at a bar and there have to be 30 and you're like, should we have, yeah, they put forth the guarantee, but should we have really done this? Like, Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll go with uh, one more question, sure. I guess, slash comment. But uh, I want to pull the this the poster up first. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about the the next show that's going on here. So well, we're uh, coming to Spring Valley, Wisconsin, which um, can't tell you the exact route to get there. I know it's a little south and a little east from the Twin Cities. Uh, I suppose you're in Fargo, so. Not entirely sure exactly what audience this is going to, but mm-hmm. uh, we're going to have a good time there with Bill Williams issuing an open challenge. As we talked about earlier, we have uh, Leslie Lamanyeka taking on Raven Radix, uh, first ever women's match. Not ever first, but first in, in quite a few years. Uh, the anarchist Eric Cannon uh, has made this poster somewhat outdated by defeating the, the natural Nelson for the TV title. And so we're going to see a rematch there um hmm. we've got pd brown who uh has been into it with the program uh as of late with stonehenge being the muscle of that group another guy who has been just uh, over the top creative when it comes to putting out content we may not necessarily like the specific content he has but you can't ignore it ignore that it's at least entertaining um, in any event, J.J. Rogue, manager, turned his back on P.D. Brown, joined the program. We're going to see what they have in store for P.D. and and much more. So it's going to be on Saturday at uh, 7 o'clock. Doors open 6 o'clock. Family-friendly entertainment, always affordable. Tickets are just 10 bucks. I don't think we generally have AWF shows where it's more than 15 so... Uh, especially in an area like that where there not might not be a lot of opportunities for live local entertainment. If you got mm-hmm. two kids nine and under, they get in free. 
tickets to 10 bucks for the adults and spend some money on popcorn and pop and have a good night of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. cameras will be rolling, rolling for our show on 45. So. Okay. Yeah. Looking at the poster, it definitely looks like it's a jam packed sh uh, show and you got uh, uh, our first time in a while, a uh, women's match on there. And then the fan favorites, Bill, Bill Williams, Petey Brown and Cannon. So yeah. And then and I don't that, know if you have the poster, but on Sunday, Russell Palooza returns to First Avenue. Uh, Rob Page and I will be calling the action from from up top uh, in the manager or the owner's suite, I believe. This is the official name for the room there. Uh, the, the event had sold out, but uh, additional tickets have been made available. So I believe the bell rings at seven. I, can't, I don't know how many additional tickets tickets there are i can't imagine it's all that many but we're gonna have a, a good time there i just saw war horse was added to the mm -hmm. event uh trying to think of who else we have aria Dabari is going to be making his return um let's see here uh trying to think of who all has been advertised you might need to just scroll that facebook page and or their Twitter account. Yep, there we go. Uh, well, oh, that's, that's actually for the Uptown VFW on yeah. uh, Saturday, May 7th, which, oh, there we go. There we got some of the guys here. Yeah. Um, Brian Keith, we saw him recently. Uh, Dante Martin, uh, Billy Starks, uh, new Uptown VFW champion, Devon Monroe. If you've never seen Devon Monroe at First Ave. Uh, that place goes just off the chains whenever he appears. Going to be a good time. 21 plus crowd. Get your tickets before they're gone again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two awesome shows coming up for AWF and First Wrestling. So, yeah. All right. Well, I want to, yeah, thank you for being on the show. And I think a lot of the, the viewers that viewed, there was quite a few comments and uh, viewers that were pretty excited to see AWF announcer DJ Draper. So, yeah, it's want to say thank you for being on the show and uh, maybe have you on some uh, next time too, or a future time too. So Sure. Thanks for having me and definitely good luck with the, uh, I don't know if podcast is the right term, but with the show. Yeah. I think we've kind of mingled with both terms, but I think the show is probably a cooler way to say it. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for being on and uh, I'm going to turn off the live in three, two. Later, dude. Yeah.